Welcome to AEP Statistics. In this video, we're going to cover associations that are seen in two-way tables with categorical data. All right, so before we dive into actually looking at some two-way tables, we should probably talk about what is an association. So if you have two categorical variables, you might wonder the question, is there an association between them? So using statistics from two-way tables is the perfect way to determine if there is an association between two categorical variables or not. So let's start with the definition of an association between variables. Two variables are said to be associated if the outcome of one variable impacts the outcome of the second. So if one variable has an impact on the second, then that would be variables that have an association. So here's a simple example of an association. Now I also want to throw out the word not independent, right? If two variables are independent, that means they have nothing to do with each other. They are independent of each other. So when we say that there is an association, we're also saying that the two variables are not independent. All right, so we can check for an association by looking at a condition relative frequencies and comparing them to marginal relative frequencies. We don't just use counts of data because two different sample sizes could be misleading. So you can't just look and say, oh, well, there's more boys that like to go to the beach, less girls that go to the beach. Clearly, if you're a boy, you're more likely to go to a beach. Ah, there's a connection. No, you, you can't just look at counts. You need to look at percentages because they take into account relative to the whole. So here would be a great example of using some percentages to actually determine that we have an association. So the marginal is the total, right? So we look at the total, all people, and maybe a survey shows that 30% of all people in a survey love chocolate. I mean, who doesn't? 30% love chocolate. I'm actually shocked it's not higher. But conditionally, if we only looked amongst the males, notice I underlined males here. So 8% of males, so that's conditional, only look at the males in the survey love chocolate. Hmm. So there must be a connection, something about the gender of male made the people less likely to like chocolate. There's, there's some type of connection or association there. And then likewise, 43% of the females in the survey love chocolate. So again, the numbers are different, right? We see a lower percentage amongst the males that like chocolate, a higher percentage amongst the females. So clearly there is an association. There is a tendency for females to be much more likely to like chocolate than males. So the 30% is kind of like our baseline because that's 30% of all people that love chocolate. We see of the males, it go down, of the females, it go up. So clearly the variable of gender has a connection or has an association on liking chocolate. So they are definitely not independent because independent would mean that they have nothing to do with each other. Now here is the actual two-way table that I got this data from. So I want you to actually be able to know how to read this to see the numbers I'm looking at. So first off, I'm looking at the total. This is the marginal, I'm looking at my totals. 60 out of 200 total people like chocolate. So remember my notation here, the proportion of people that like chocolate out of everybody, 60 total people like chocolate, that's everybody that likes chocolate. Some are male, some are female, who cares, but 60 total people like chocolate out of 200, and of course, that is my 30%. But then I say, all right, let's look at a gender. Let, let's, again, we're still going to continue to look at chocolate. I mean, the question is still focusing on the proportion of people that like chocolate. But I want to see if adding the condition of male changes that. Now, remember, this is conditional probability where in the front of the line is what we're looking for, liking chocolate. But behind is the condition. The condition just limits my denominator. Now, I'm only, to, only allowed to look at the 75 males. So the condition lowered my denominator. It, it set a rule. My denominator is you're only allowed to look at 75 males, of which six like chocolate. And that is approximately 8%. So we see that there's a tendency that if you're a male, you're less likely to like chocolate. And then we can also look at the females. Again, we're still focusing on chocolate, but we're saying, all right, what if the condition of female is brought up? Would that change the proportion? So now the condition of female changes my denominator. I'm only allowed to look at the 125 females. Of those 125 females, 54 like chocolate and 54 divided by 125, grab a calculator if you need to, is about 43%, 0.432 to be exact, but just, you know, roughly speaking, 43%. So we do see here that, again, there's a tendency that the, the variable of, of gender affects liking chocolate. Males less, females more. Nice way to look at that. All right, let's look at an example where we see no association, just so we understand. No association means independence. 
that means the two variables are not related. The outcome of one has nothing to do with the other. Here would be a great example looking at some numbers. And you need numbers to prove this. You can't just like think of well, my personal opinion. No, but you got to have numbers, right? It's math class. All right, so here are the marginal. Marginal is the total. So we looked at a bunch of students in a survey, and 43% of all students said they enjoy riding their bike for exercise. Who doesn't? That's fun, right? Then in that same survey, we only looked at high schoolers. So again, I underlined the condition of the high schoolers. Again, not looking at all students, just the high schoolers. 43% enjoyed riding their bike. Oh, so if I'm a high schooler, it didn't, it didn't mean I'm more likely or less likely to enjoy riding my bike. It stayed the same. And then as well, looking at the middle schoolers, 43% of the middle schoolers, again, enjoy riding their bike for exercise. So we see the same number. That actually means that they're not independent. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm so sorry. I said that wrong. That means that they are independent. Because what that is showing is that when I added the condition of your high school or middle school, that didn't make the percentage of kids that enjoy riding their bike go up or go down. It stayed the same. So it just goes to show that um, you know your your grade level has nothing to do with whether or not you ride it like riding a bike. 43% of all kids like riding a bike, 43% of high schoolers, 43% of middle schoolers. Riding your bike does not depend on if you're high school or middle school. Where we just saw liking chocolate, well, it depends if you're a girl, goes up, male goes down. Here, doesn't change. Now, here is the actual table values where that data came from. So let's once again, let's make sure we understand this. So first we start with our margin, looking at the total. And we see that 237 total kids enjoy riding their bike. Again, how to read it that way. So what proportion of kids love riding their bike? Well, again, that's 237 out of 550. Grab a calculator if you need to, but it's 0.431. So pretty darn close to 43% of all kids in my survey enjoy riding their bike. But let's see if being a middle schooler changes that. So again, we're still looking at riding a bike. We're not looking at anything else, but we want to add in the condition that you are in middle school. Now remember, that condition affects my denominator. I'm now only allowed to look at the 300 middle schoolers. Because again, that's the condition. Of those 300 middle schoolers, 129 of them enjoy riding their bike. 129 divided by 300 is exactly 0.43. So we do see a slight difference here, 43.1% to 43%. You know, I'll give a, a, a you know less than 1%, give or take. It should be pretty close. So again, it just goes to show that if you're a middle school student, it didn't make you more likely or less likely to enjoy riding your bike. And then we can look at the high schoolers as well. Again, still focusing on riding a bike, but now we want to see if you're in high school, if that matters, if that changes anything. A condition changes your denominator, so I'm now only allowed to look at the 250 kids that are in high school. Of those 250 kids in high school, 108 of them enjoy riding their bike. 108 out of 250 is 0.432. So they're not all exactly the same to the, you know, the 18th decimal place, but um, they're all really, really close to each other, which again shows that they are independent. It just goes to show that the grade level does not dictate the percentage or the likelihood that a student likes riding their bike. So a couple of things I want to make sure I comment on. Notice that I started off with just riding a bike total, right? Didn't care about middle school, or high school, 237 total. Then we still looked at riding a bike amongst the middle schoolers. Then we still looked at riding a bike amongst the high schoolers. A lot of kids will get this wrong when they flip-flop. Like some kids will put middle school in the front and then bike in the back, and that just misses all. That means you're actually changing what you're looking at, and that's not going to lead to the right answer. So again, we just saw two really good examples of where we see that there is an association, not independent, versus we'd have no association, which is independent. So let's look at... Um, you know, the idea here is there, there, there's, there's a huge, important, very common question that is asked about two categorical variables, right? This question about is there an association, it's a really big question. Like, I'm telling you, it's going to be on the AP stats test somehow, some way, free response, multiple choice. Kind of a big question. You need to know how to answer it, and you need to know how to prove it. You don't just have a feeling. You have to prove it with numbers like I just did in the last couple of examples, don't just say yes or no. you got to give some reason with conditional relative frequency. So let's actually look at an example where we don't know the answer going into it, and we're going to try to see if we can figure it out. 
So, simple random sample of 188 students was taken one morning at Beaver High School, and students were asked how they arrived to school. Did you ride the bus? Did you come with mom or dad? Did you drive yourself? Did you walk? We also observed, of the 188 students, whether or not they were tardy to their first class. So maybe we went around and asked the teachers, hey, who was tardy, who wasn't? And then we made a two-way table connecting all the dots here. So in this two-way table, we see the total for kids and how they got to school, and we also see the total for kids that were tardy. So 64 kids were tardy, it's kind of a lot, to their first block class. All right, so the question is, is there an association between these two variables? Does how you get to school play a part in you being tardy? Or are they not even related at all? Would that would mean they would be independent? So again, we can't just look at numbers. You know, some, sometimes they'll say, oh yeah, look at that. 41 kids that drove themselves were tardy. Oh yeah, yeah, there's an association here. You need percentages. Because notice our totals are all different. You have 90 kids drive themselves and only 29 drove with the parents. So you, you can't just look at counts. You got to look at percentages or proportions. So I always like to start off with my total. So let's look at the total, you know, let's, let's focus on being tardy, right? So 64 total kids were tardy. And um, that's 64 out of 188. So I got to get a number here. 64 out of 188 is 0.340. So pretty close, a couple extra decimals there, but pretty close to 34% of kids are tardy. Seems kind of high to me. Uh, maybe the school should work on that. But now we want to see, Hey, let's look at the kids that ride the bus. But again, I'm still focusing on being tardy. I'm not changing what I'm looking at because then if you start changing what you're looking at, you're, you're not going to come to the right answer. You're going to have wrong numbers. But I want to see is the condition I ride the bus. Does riding the bus make you more or less likely to be tardy? So once again, remember that condition of riding a bus changes my denominator. 35 total kids rode the bus. That becomes my denominator. Of those 35 kids, nine were tardy to their first block class. Nine divided by 35 is 0.257. Oh boy. That kind of gives me my answer right there. If you rode the bus, the bus should get you to school on time. Buses should not be late. You are less likely to be tardy. Now, some kids were still tardy. I mean, still 25% of the kids that ride the bus were tardy. But in comparison to the 34% overall, this does go to show that Hey, riding the bus should make kids less likely to be tardy. All right, let's look at those that drive. So again, we're still going to focus on being tardy, but we want to see, does the condition that you drive yourself to school, does that change the fact that 34% of kids are tardy? So remember, the condition changes my denominator. So I'm now only allowed to look at the 90 kids that drove themselves to school. Of those 90 kids, 41 were tardy. 41 out of 90 is 0.456. Holy crap, holy. So what we found out is that if you drive yourself to school, 45.6% of kids were tardy. Of those that rode the bus, 25.7% were tardy. Listen, as a teacher, I think both those numbers are too high. But compared to the total, which was 34%, if you ride the bus, you're less likely to be tardy. If you drive yourself to school, you're way more likely to be tardy. Now, I know I didn't analyze driven by a parent or walking, but I, maybe you don't need to because this tells the story. Is there an association between being tardy and how you get to school? What I got in front of me is enough to answer the question. Now we got to write up a nice answer. And this is where a lot of kids go wrong. They just want to put yes or no, or they just want to write down numbers on a paper. You got to make sure you explain yourself. So here's a really great answer that I would expect on a test or quiz. Yes, there is an association between how students arrive to school and if they are tardy to the first class. Of all students in the sample, 34% were tardy. I'm trying to, you know, create that baseline. But amongst those that drive themselves, 45.6% were tardy. It clearly goes up. Of those that arrive by bus, 25.7% were tardy. It goes down. So it seems that there is a tendency that if a student drives themselves to school, they're more likely to be tardy, while those that arrive by bus are less likely to be tardy. There's clearly a relationship here. There is an association. There is a connection. Now, the only word we cannot use is cause because this was not an experiment. We cannot say if you drive yourself to school, it will cause you to be tardy. No, 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 no. Way too many confounding variables. But we can say there's a tendency, a connection, an association, a relationship. We clearly see that. Now, listen, 
If 34% of kids are tardy and across the board, 34% of walkers are tardy, 30% of bus drivers are tardy, 34% of kids that drive themselves are tardy. If we saw 34 across the board, then it would actually show there's no association. Like, listen, I guess it doesn't matter how you get to school. At the end of the day, 34% of kids are tardy. But based on this data, there clearly is an association. This is a huge question when it comes to two-way tables. I don't want to say it's the only question because we could ask you some other stuff, but this is the big one that's always going to be there. So make sure you're ready for it. Hope you learned.